You're watching InfoSec Bytes, a crash course in information security for journalists. We're based at the Centre for Investigative Journalism in London and supported by the Logan Foundation. This video is part one of our introduction to PGP. This video is provided for information only. It cannot replace the advice of a trained security professional. If lives or safety depend on your security, please seek the advice of an expert. The Centre for Investigative Journalism is a pioneer in providing expert information security training services to journalists and journalistic institutions. To consult with an expert through the CIJ or to arrange a CIJ training session, contact the address on screen. The tutorial you are about to watch is the first of a series on using PGP to encrypt your emails and files. We first explain PGP and some of the basic concepts behind it. In later videos, we get hands-on with PGP and show you how to use it. Click or tap on the pop-up message to access the PGP playlist. If you're interested in learning encryption, you'll already have heard of PGP. It's one of the most well-known and popular forms of encryption, especially for professionals. This is because PGP is primarily used to encrypt emails, and if you're a journalist, a lot of your work will involve using email and you might appreciate being able to encrypt them. The thing is, PGP is among the most difficult kinds of encryption to do properly, in part because it is quite complicated. For that reason, it isn't the best place to start if you're learning to use encryption. It's too easy to get fed up and stop using it. If you're new to encryption, it might be a good idea to watch our tutorials on Signal Private Messenger first, to get the hang of using a simpler encryption program and then return to this video when you're done. Click or tap on the pop-up message to access those videos now. But if you want to proceed, stay tuned. So, what is PGP? PGP is actually a brand name. It is the name of a particular encryption program owned by the PGP Corporation and Symantec, originally programmed by Phil Zimmerman and published in 1991. The letters PGP stand for Pretty good privacy. PGP was a program that allowed people to encrypt their emails and files, and which popularized encryption to a mass audience in the 1990s. But PGP is also not just a brand name. Sometimes a brand name becomes so synonymous with a type of product that it becomes the generic name for it. For example, Coke can just mean any kind of cola drink. And nowadays, Google just means search. In the same way, PGP doesn't just refer to the PGP encryption program, but to the standard for encrypting and decrypting data that was created by PGP. PGP was so popular that it became an open standard for encryption, which anyone could write programs to comply with. This meant that not just the original PGP program, but lots of other programs could also be written to do PGP, and they were. They are all interoperable. Data encrypted with one program can be decrypted with another one. The PGP standard is called OpenPGP, but frequently when people talk about sending an encrypted mail, they just say PGP. So what makes PGP special? First of all, it is pretty much the only widespread way of doing encryption for emails. There are other ways of doing email encryption, but none of them enjoy the ubiquity of PGP. So if you want to do encrypted email, for the moment, you have to use PGP. But secondly, PGP is a freely available and popular example of an important kind of encryption called public key encryption. So what is public key encryption? To explain this, it is helpful to look at the history of cryptography in the 20th century. You see, public key encryption was actually a major breakthrough of the 20th century. Throughout history, the major users of cryptography have been states. States tend to engage in warfare and espionage, and in these fields there is an extremely high investment in communicating securely and preventing the enemy from being able to listen to communications. For this reason, in the same way as they are the major drivers of weapons technology, state and military R&D budgets are major drivers of developments in cryptography. Vast amounts of money are spent, and were spent in the past, trying to create secure ways of communication, 
and many of the major innovations in encryption came about because of military and intelligence research. For a long time, before public key encryption was invented, all encryption, even the encryption that was used by governments, was a kind of encryption called symmetric encryption. Symmetric encryption is the precursor of public key cryptography. With symmetric encryption, you start with a piece of information, a plain text. You also have an encryption key, the secret code, which is ultimately just a really long, hard-to-guess number. Your encryption key is used to encrypt the plain text. Once it is encrypted, the message becomes a ciphertext. The ciphertext is meaningless and cannot be read without the key. It is then transmitted, and let's take a military scenario, so this might mean a command headquarters transmitting orders to a military unit. Even if the transmission is intercepted by the enemy, if the enemy is able to listen in, all they will get is the cipher text. But when the unit receives the message, it is able to decrypt the message with the key, changing the cipher text back into a plain text, and then reading the message. This kind of encryption is called symmetric encryption because the same key is used to encrypt the message as is used to decrypt the message. The same key does both the encryption and the decryption. Symmetric encryption was highly useful to states and militaries because during some of the 20th century's wars, it meant it was possible to communicate battle orders and secret messages without the enemy finding out what they were. But symmetric encryption also had its problems. Because it was the same key that was used to encrypt and to decrypt, the sender and the receiver had to both have the same key. This meant that the key had to be shared between all of the parties who had to communicate. The key itself could not just be transmitted, because then the enemy might be able to intercept it. It had to be carefully entrusted to each of the parties and kept secret. And worse still, all it took was for one of the parties to get careless or to defect, and then the enemy would have the key. And with the key, the enemy could listen in and decrypt the communications, getting the troop movements before they happened. Losing control of the key in this way could lose you a war. Fine, you might say, just keep them secret. But imagine telling a hundred friends a secret and expecting them all to keep it. The more people you tell, the more likely it is that one of them will give it away. In a similar way, it is logistically very difficult to keep your encryption key secret if hundreds of parties are given a copy, and some of them are even on the front line of a war, where they could easily be captured. It means everyone must be trained to follow extremely rigorous security procedures. Using symmetric encryption for large-scale communications is therefore really difficult and prohibitively expensive. And this means that, from a practical perspective, it is inherently insecure. For this reason, there was a very strong incentive for someone to invent a new encryption technology, a replacement for symmetric encryption, which had none of these problems. And that's where public key cryptography comes in. Another name for public key cryptography is asymmetric encryption. Encryption that is not symmetric. And it's called this because with asymmetric encryption, there is not one, but two keys, a key pair. With asymmetric encryption, the key that is used to encrypt the message is different to the key that is used to decrypt the message. You see, using advanced mathematics and powerful computers, it had become possible to create a scheme for encryption which involved very large numbers with special mathematical properties, resulting in two keys with a special mathematical relationship. Because of this special mathematical relationship, a plain text encrypted with one of the keys could only be decrypted by the other key. These mathematical properties were extremely useful for cryptography. It meant that one of the pair of keys, the one used to encrypt, could be made completely public. You could give it out to everyone, and it didn't matter as long as the other one was kept secret. With the public key, anyone could encrypt messages, and once encrypted, they could only be decrypted with the secret key. It was no longer necessary 
for a single vulnerable encryption key to be pre-shared with all of the parties who needed to communicate. Instead, every party could have a unique pair of encryption keys, one of them public and the other secret. By exchanging their public keys, they would be able to communicate with each other securely. And even if one of the parties was compromised, that only meant one key pair was compromised. Any two other parties could still communicate securely. That's a general overview of what asymmetric encryption, or in other words, public key encryption, does. If it seems a little complicated, don't worry. In part two of our introduction to PGP, we're going to look at public key encryption again, in detail, and show you how PGP is used to communicate between different parties. To watch it, click or tap on the pop-up message and choose the Tales video playlist. Thanks for watching InfoSec Bytes. If you found this video useful, please share it widely with your colleagues and co-workers. To support the Centre for Investigative Journalism with a donation, please visit tcij.org forward slash donate. And if you would like to watch our other videos, please go to infosecbytes.org or subscribe to our channel below.